Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It is a Saturday morning here in Texas and uh, hopefully y'all loving on Jesus. Spending time with Jesus, growing to know Jesus, growing to walk with Jesus, growing to love him, growing to know his love for you um, and growing to obey him. And, and as importantly, growing to repent where where we fall short in obeying him. Um, and again, repentance is, is, you know, it's important we understand that repentance is not something we do out of condemnation. The Lord never condemns us, okay? The Holy Spirit convicts us. We repent, you know, of our mistakes. We repent of our sins. Um, we acknowledge them and we ask forgiveness and we move on, right? So thank you, Lord Jesus. My beautiful wife, May, and I just returned um, yesterday evening, actually, from uh, from a wonderful Thanksgiving time in, uh, in actually in the Northeast in Connecticut with my my mother and father and just, uh, you know, just all the, the friends and family. We were just blessed. I mean, there's just there was so much. We, there's, there's there's so many testimonies that have come out of it. I, uh, you know, my uh, close friends, Scott and Leanne, um, you know, hosted us uh, is, uh, you know, as far as you know, letting us use their, their home when we needed it. We stay with my parents, but, uh, you know, they always open their home for exercise or showers or anything we need. Um, and, um, you know, my boy Matthew and I just had a, just had a lot of fellowship together and, uh, you know, looking for Matthew to walk with Jesus some more, right, buddy? And, uh, you know, my, uh, my good friend Robin that I grew up with and, uh, and her husband Rich, and we got some fellowship together. Rob and I were, were playing some pickleball with, uh, with Scott and Shona and my, uh, my friend Scott and his, and his uh, mixed doubles partner Shona are like, I don't know, they're like senior professionals or something. I mean, it's, um, I'm enjoying this pickleball now and it's helped me to lose some weight, but man, I'm telling you, these, these people can, can play. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm an amateur, but, uh, you know, but we enjoyed it. We had a lot of fellowship. We had a lot of community. We had a wonderful Thanksgiving time. We, uh, my, uh, my auntie Kathy had, uh, had gone home to be with Jesus at uh, my parents' house, so we missed her, right, Rick and Uncle Richie, and uh, it was just nice fellowship we had at, at our home with, uh, you know, with my mother and father and Liz and my wife and I, and then always we go to Bruce and Sharon's house and, uh, you know, Robin's parents and just uh, great fellowship to Cowboys one, so that was nice, so thank you, Lord Jesus. My buddy Bobby and I went out and, uh, and blessed some folks that... Uh, that live in the inner city that, that don't have much for Thanksgiving. And so that was a, a blessed time. So it was just a good time. Um, you know, it's, it's hard being away from home for, for nine days. Thank you, uncle Jimmy for watching the dogs and, uh, you know, but it's, it's good to be back. Um, man, it's, uh, we're going to begin the first of our Christmas teachings today. Um, this, uh, you know, this, this teaching Stephen has told me will go out on, on the 9th of December. And, uh, and so today we're going to be discussing Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 25. Just a, uh, I mean, this is a, a truly incredible teaching. Um, when we look inside of it and when we break it down, right, Jason, I mean, I'm overwhelmed at the character of Joseph here, a young man, um, Frankly, I confess that when I look at his character, I find myself wanting. I'm not at a level in my walk with God that uh, that Joseph is, um, but but I want to be right. And so we're going to just get into some things here. And so, Father, we we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and love in our lives, Father. Father, we thank you that we have our Bible. We thank you that we have the living word of God. But above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life for us. We thank you for dying a, a torturous death for us. <clears throat> and we thank you that you're alive and risen today and we worship you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. We ask you to give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start in verses 18, and it goes through verse 25. Um, again, and this is this is this is off the chain. Okay, um, I mean it's just this is big. Okay, all right, y'all ready? Matthew one verse eighteen. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So when we read our Bible, okay, um, you just don't want to read it like you're just reading words on a page. This is the living word of God. You want to break it down. You want to, you want to look into it. You want to, you want to step back and ask questions in the scriptures, right? Golly. Look at, uh, when I was, uh, when we were doing Bible study, my wife and I were doing Bible study at a, at a coffee shop that, uh, that my boy Matthew had, uh, had, had shown us. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was I was highlighting. You can see on YouTube, my boy Dustin gave me uh, gave me a couple highlighters, and so you see the the purple and light blue highlights on every verse. Every verse here, right? These uh, these eight verses, right? All right, verse eighteen. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. This is what the Bible teaches. The Bible is the word of God. This is what happened, okay? Faith has been said is taking God at his word, right? The reason you and I believe in Jesus is because it says it in our Bible. The reason we we believe that God became a man, as we're gonna read down here in, uh, in verse 23, right? Is because it says it in our Bible, right? Our God became a human man for us, okay? Lived a perfect life for us that we could never live, died a torturous death for us that we should have died as sinful people and was raised from the dead, right? We believe that because it says it in our Bible. Verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Okay. Mary is probably around 15 or 16 years old here. Um, In in Jesus's day, in that time, um, there was was three steps to the process. Okay. Um, There, you know, there was the, the initial step where generally the parents would often arrange um, why the children were very young, the wedding. Um, and then there was this pledge or this betrothal or what we would call an engagement. But in their day, and you know, an engagement is they were, they were already married. Okay. In order to break off an engagement or this pledge in, uh, in Jesus's day, you would need to, you would need to actually have a certificate of divorce. Okay. Um, they had not come together as husband and wife yet. They had not had sexual intimacy as husband and wife yet. The wedding had not took place yet, but 
in Jesus's day, the engagement had a far more binding, you know, strength than we do in our day. It was, it was again, similar to being full blown, full blown married in, in the United States, right? So if you're married in the United States and you've gotten married and you went and got a, a wedding certificate, right? And you filed that, then you need a certificate of divorce. And so that's the state they were in. They were in that second state, right? Where they were engaged, um, but it was solidified. Okay. It was, it was like they were, they were already married, but they hadn't gone and had the wedding yet. Right. So it says his mother, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. It's a done deal. But before they came together, okay. Before they had sexual intimacy, before the wedding, she was found to be with child through the Holy spirit. So Matthew tells us plainly that, you know, Mary was a virgin, um, she had obviously never been with any man, had never, you know, had not slept with Joseph. And yet now she's found to be with child. And it tells us that the child is through the Holy Spirit. OK, when it says through the Holy Spirit, obviously there's no there was no sexual thing that where Mary was pregnant. Simply God, the Holy Spirit. Right. Just thought and Mary was pregnant. The Holy Spirit willed it. And Mary had conceived a child in her womb, okay? Um, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit, okay? This is the only time this has ever happened, okay? Um, now, uh, throughout the Old Testament, right, um, we see that, that God had opened the wombs of different women that that weren't able to have children and but they still had children in the in the natural way in the in the normal way of of uh of sexual intimacy where the husband and wife come together um and, and they get pregnant right and oftentimes god would would bless that intimacy and they would get pregnant this is this is different now okay um mary had never been with a man but she is found to be with child. It says she was found to be with child. I don't really, uh, you know, never having been pregnant, as I've said before, candidly. So I, I don't understand how all this works. Um, you know, I don't know if it, uh, you know, if, if she was, you know, you know, I don't, how, how does all that work? I mean, y'all know better than I do. But, you know, when a woman is pregnant, um, you know, there may be signs that she's pregnant um, even before she knows it. Right. Um, you know, isn't there like a morning sickness or something is my understanding. Um, or maybe she's beginning to show now. Right. Um, we cannot begin to imagine the difficulty that a 15 or 16 year old Mary is dealing with here. Okay. In Jesus's day, if you were unfaithful to your husband, um, you could be stoned and killed and put to death for that infidelity, okay? Um, we're told in the story in, in, uh, in Luke, right? Um, in Luke chapter one, we see how, how this came about where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and she, uh, you know, and he tells her, you know, what's going to happen. And, um, you know, that's a beautiful account. And, you know, Lord willing, we'll be going through that in a few weeks, right? Um, so the trial, the hardship, the difficulty, the suffering, the anguish that Mary is dealing with here is something we cannot understand. Okay. It's this incredible privilege that she's going to, she's carrying the God child inside of her, the God man, right? Jesus is fully God and fully man. And, I, and I've often said, I don't, I don't understand why the Lord does these things in this way, right? As I said in, uh, in Luke, you know, chapter one, we can see the account. I guess I'll go ahead and quickly read it there, um, where, you know, um, where Mary is told what's going to happen. Okay. Um, it says in Luke one, verse 26, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, 27 to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. 
The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay. Um, and he tells him about Elizabeth. And then in 38, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So Matthew doesn't go into that whole account. Um, again, we find that in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Um, again, the power of the Most High will come on you, and, and bam, she's pregnant, okay? Again, God the Holy Spirit simply has a thought. Mary's pregnant. He, he wills it by his thoughts, okay? That's the power of of the Most High, the power of God. Remember, we have a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. But look at verse 19 here, okay? It says, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Um. There is a character in Joseph here that I don't know that I've ever seen, okay? There is a character in Joseph here. There is a quality of, uh, of righteousness in Joseph, of lifestyle righteousness, that is rarely seen in the church, in Christians, and certainly nowhere outside of it. But look what it says. Just read the verse, right, Corinne? Let's, look at this, Taylor. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. You see that, Scott? He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, why is he going to divorce her at all? Okay. We read in Luke 1 that the angel appears to Mary. One would wonder, why didn't the angel Gabriel appear to Mary and Joseph at the same time? Why is Joseph divorcing her, Matthew? Okay, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and didn't want, did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And we'll talk about that quality. It says he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He was still going to divorce her. Okay, we have to believe. I certainly believe. Right, when Mary was found to be with child, that she would have told her husband. Right, again. Mary is already her husband. When you're engaged in Jesus's day, that's already your husband. Again, uh, you haven't had the wedding yet. You haven't come together uh, uh, in sexual intimacy yet. But it, surely she told her husband what happened. And, and regrettably, he, he doesn't believe her. Now, again, all of us can understand, right? I don't know if there have been women you know, since then, in the last 2,000 years that have tried to say this, right? Imagine your husband comes home and you're pregnant, right? And you guys hadn't had intimacy for a long time. And the wife says, well, listen, this would happen. An angel appeared to me and his name was, was Gabriel. And he said that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost was going to come on me and overshadow me and that I would be made pregnant by the Spirit of God, that just the the over the overshadowing, the power of the Spirit of God, and I would simply be pregnant. And that's what happened. I, I guess many of us, most of us, probably all of us, right, as men, um, would, would have a hard time believing that story. But I will say this, Joseph should have believed her. OK, um, I understand it's a hard story to believe, but Joseph should have believed her. Now, it doesn't tell us here that Mary told him. But again, you know, obviously, 
you know, is Mary just going to, you know, just, just leave him hanging, just leave him. Imagine how hurt Joseph feels. Imagine how betrayed Joseph feels. He's divorcing her, obviously, here, uh, right, Corinne, because he believes that Mary has been unfaithful, right? And so Joseph, as a righteous man, is just going to, you know, um, just pick up his bags. He's going to tuck his tail between his legs. He's going to walk off into the sunset. And in his mind, he's going to allow Mary and whoever this guy is, in his mind, that's gotten her pregnant, and he's going to let them have a wife together. Um, but he doesn't believe her, and he should believe her, Stephen, okay? But look at this quality, and again, this is so central to this text, and I cannot say enough about this. In my own life, in the life of the church, Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Now, what does that mean, he was a righteous man? Th the word righteous in the Bible has three different meanings, okay? It can be referring, uh, the word righteous can mean self-righteous. Someone who's self-righteous believes that they're going to, they're going to get to heaven they're going to please God by their own righteous life. They believe that by living a righteous life, they're going to be able to stand before God. They have not humbled themselves before God. They have not confessed themselves as hopeless, helpless, desperate sinners in need of a Savior, and that without Jesus, only hell awaits. Okay, Someone who's self-righteous believes that in their own righteousness, they can please God and ultimately go to heaven. Now, the opposite of self-righteousness is what's called imputed righteousness, right? Imputed righteousness is the actual righteous life that Jesus lived when he walked the earth is credited to us when we receive Christ as our Savior, and all of our sin, past, present, and future, is credited to Jesus at the cross, okay? We are made righteous before God, not based on anything we have done, would do or could do, but simply by receiving Christ as Savior, right? John 1, 12 says, yet to all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. We are made right before God, not based on anything we can do or would do, but simply by receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, acknowledging our hopelessness, our helplessness and humility, acknowledging our desperation and that there's nothing we can do. And out of that heart, we go before Jesus and simply receive him as our Lord and Savior, right? We put our full trust, confidence, and reliance in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul, right, Ian? Okay, but now this third kind of righteousness, the one that the Bible speaks of the most in most passages, is what's called a lifestyle righteousness, okay? It's how we live our lives, right, Lauren? Joseph, it says here, when it says Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, it was speaking of his lifestyle. Now, we don't get to heaven by any, any lifestyle righteousness that we have. But because Joseph is a God-fearing man, because he understands that he is a hopeless sinner, right? Um, he's, he's the kind of man that lives a righteous life. What does that mean? He's certainly not perfect. He's wrong, right? It's sinful for him not to believe Mary. He has it wrong here. Again, it doesn't say that Mary told him, but I certainly believe most of us would believe in that situation. Of course, Mary's going to go and share the story with Joseph. And imagine how hurtful it is for Mary when Joseph doesn't believe her. Obviously, if he believed her, he wouldn't be divorcing her, right? But even though he feels hurt, even though he feels betrayed, even though he feels wronged, right? And try to imagine this. Try to imagine how betrayed you would feel, right? The woman you're in love with has totally betrayed you, right? And has gone off and gotten pregnant now by what you believe to be another man. How do we react in that? How do we react when we are wronged by others, when we are betrayed by others, when we are, you know, treated poorly by others, how do we react? And I'm going to say that in the church today and obviously in the entire world, this is not the way we act. And it's sinful. And it is a massive area of repentance for us. Right, Rap? 
Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, a righteous man in, in, in this kind of righteousness, someone who has a lifestyle of righteousness, he's the kind of man who takes the time to think about what's right in any situation so he can do what's right simply because it's right. And whatever the situation is, he wants to consider what's right, right? Now, again, uh, Joseph is a sinful man like all of us, but he's actually a man who has a lifestyle of consistently doing what's right and certainly repenting where he hasn't done what's right. And we're going to see that here down when we get to uh, verse 24, right? He's going to change his mind. He's going to repent and he's going to do what the angel tells him to do. Okay. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. When you're wronged, when someone speaks poorly of you, when someone disrespects you, okay, when you feel, you know, cheated or, uh, you know, betrayed, is this the heart you have? Do you have the kind of heart that Joseph has? Do you have a lifestyle of righteousness that, you know, when you're, uh, you know, when you're mistreated or when someone does something wrong to you or to others, are you quiet about it? Are you to, or do you go out of your way to tell anyone who will listen the wrong or the imp impropriety or the uh, betrayal that was done to you or done to someone else? And obviously, if you look inside your own heart, you will see that consistently in your life, for whatever reason, we have this need to share the wrong that's been done to us or done to others with other people. We have an apparent need to share the failings of others and, and just to, to look to expose them to public disgrace. And, and it really is a disgrace in our own hearts, okay? Remember Jesus told us to, to, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Every single one of us are sinful people. Every single one of us has done wrong. And every single one of us still makes mistakes and are sinful in different aspects of our lives. I would literally have to take a vacation day to tell you the things that I need to do better, to tell you the mistakes that I make throughout my day, right? Mistakes in my thoughts, mistakes in my words, and sometimes mistakes in my actions. I'm, I'm consistently, daily really, repenting over areas of my life that need to be better, okay? And they're wrong. When we make mistakes, we have to call them wrong. We call it sin, we say it's wrong, we ask for forgiveness, right? We apologize to anyone we've done wrong, and we certainly go before the Lord, right? Um, and when we know, you know, it is what it is. We, we, we call it what we call it, right? First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Simply meaning that if you go before your heavenly Father and acknowledge your sin and ask for forgiveness, then you won't have to undergo the same discipline or punishment from your heavenly father as someone who just has no lifestyle of acknowledging their mistakes at all, right? But this quality in Joseph, I'm telling you, if any man is looking for a spouse, a woman, or if any woman is looking for a spouse, looking for a husband, you won't do better than a man like Joseph, okay? Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, because he had a lifestyle of thinking about what's right and doing what's right, simply because it's right. Again, he wasn't perfect in this, but this was his lifestyle. This was his general way, okay? Most of us as Christians do not have this lifestyle, okay? Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her, look at this word, quietly. He didn't have to go out of his way to say to everyone that would listen, do you know what that woman did to me? 
Oh, do you know what that man did? Oh, Mary's supposed to be this righteous and wonderful lady, but you know what? She gave me this whole story that uh, she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what Joseph did, right? Even though he feels betrayed, try to imagine yourself when you feel the most betrayed. We, if anyone does any wrong, we take joy in exposing oftentimes that person's failures. And, and again, we ought to be in the fear of God in that, okay? I labor in, in my life to not consistently talk about what others are doing wrong or when other people make mistakes or when this person did this or that person did that or that preacher did that. You know what? Save the grace of God, all of us have done wrong. I certainly have and do at times, right? But we ought to go out of our way of being quiet, okay? And not having to tell everybody every wrong, every mistake, every sin, every failure in the life of others. That's a sure sign that you really don't have a righteous lifestyle like Joseph and like you ought to. It's a sure sign if we have a need to consistently speak to others about the failures of others done to us or done in general, that there is a heart issue in your life and it's an area of repentance for us. And if you're listening to this today, okay, you ought to see this clearly in your life and you ought to go before the Lord and repent and simply saying, you know, Lord, I want to be a man like Joseph. I want to to be a woman who acts like Joseph, Lord, when I'm wronged, let alone if I'm betrayed. Lord, I have, you know, how does Joseph do this? Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Again, we go out of our way, right, man? We want to expose people. We want to talk people. When you hear people talking negatively, about others or talking about the failures of others done to them or, or done to someone else, there ought to be something inside of you that's convicted and grieved and says, you know what, that's enough. Save the grace of God, go us all. The reason people do this is because they don't understand their own frailty, their own sinfulness, their own ungodliness, right? They may think, you know, I certainly wouldn't do that particular thing. And, and that may be true. All of us fall and are tempted and have different, uh, different failings in different ways. And so, yes, you may not have been a person who, who would uh, go out and, uh, and cheat on your spouse and, and, you know, make these mistakes. But in what other ways are you failing before the Lord, right? Um, my, uh, my buddy Scott was telling me this this week, right? You who have not sinned. Jesus said in, uh, in John chapter 8, you cast the first stone at the woman in adultery, right? To all the religious leaders that were thinking they were so righteous. And everyone dropped their stones and walked away. Because the only sinless being is Jesus. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to, to divorce her quietly again. This quietly, okay? He didn't have a need to tell anybody. Or to talk to any about it. You know, hurt people generally want to hurt people, right? He didn't feel like he needed to go out and get retribution against Mary because of all the wrong done to him. And again, where we do this, it's something we want to look at ourselves and simply go before our Heavenly Father and say, Father, I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me where I have a need to consistently talk about the failings of others. Father, I know that I have failed consistently, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me and forgive me, Lord, of my sin, and help me to be forgiving and have this, this heart and mind of Joseph, where we don't want to go out of our way to expose people or talk about their failings, but just to, just to be quiet about it and to be circumspect about the areas in our own life that need correction. Help us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Wow. Do you see that quality, y'all? Can you see that quality, Robin, in this? Mm. Look at verse 20. And this is interesting. But after he had considered this, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? But after he had considered this, 
when we're wronged, when we're mistreated, we don't generally consider it, right? Remember I said uh, lifestyle righteousness is someone, right, Kristen, who takes the time to think about what's right. You see that, Nathan? So they can do what's right simply because it's right. In whatever situation, you just want to, I want to think about what's the right thing to do here. I want to consider what is the right action. Now, again, of course, none of us do this perfectly. But are you trying to get better at this? Okay. But after he had considered this, so Joseph didn't just go out and the moment he was wronged, started telling everybody what that woman did to me. Do you know what that lady did? Do you know how bad she betrayed me? And in that story, again, first of all, he's wrong to divorce her because she hadn't done anything wrong, right? And that's a whole separate story in itself. But even when we are genuinely wrong, are we the type of people who take time to consider it and to think about what is the will of Jesus, Becky, in any situation? Are we the type of people that just have this need to just quickly fly off the handle and tell anyone who will listen what our coworker did wrong to us, right? Or what, you know, our family member did wrong to us or what our, our child had done wrong to us, right? Um, it's a horrible quality. And again, we see this, this incredible quality in Joseph that um, is so rare, there's no words for it. And as I said, the more we understand our own frailties, the more we understand we are not righteous, the less we'll have a need to talk about other people's failings. And we'll begin to look at the log in our own eye, as Jesus said, instead of worrying about the speck in our brother's and sister's eye. Let's, type, let's be the type of people that consider what's the right course of action when we've been wronged. Let's be the type of people that but after he had considered this, he took time to consider that, you know what? I don't want Mary to be hurt. I certainly don't want her to be killed. I don't want her to be stoned. I don't want to expose her to public disgrace. Again, generally the opposite heart that most people and even regrettably most Christians have when they've been wronged or they just look or get excited when, when people do wrong things, right? Um he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So he thought about this. He considered this. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, why does it say after he considered this? I would have liked the dream like beforehand. It would have been nice, Lord, if you could have given me this dream and told me that Mary is going to be with child and is from the Holy Spirit. It would have been nice if I didn't have to go through this heart-wrenching feeling that I had been betrayed by my wife. Why does the Lord do things in this way, y'all? Why is the Lord so consistently doing things in this way? But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Man, again, I, again, just try to step back and think of this. Wouldn't it have been great, like if why Joseph and Mary were having dinner together, the angels showed up and said, hey, y'all, I just want to let you know that, you know, y'all have found favor in the eyes of God and the Holy Spirit's going to come on Mary and she's going to give birth to a savior and you're going to give him the name Jesus, then, then Mary would not have had to go through this, this crushing anguish that she's pregnant and yet she has not been unfaithful. She's never been with a man. She's still a virgin. Her husband doesn't believe her. She has to be fearing for her own life here, right? Why does the Lord do it in this way? But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. It's as if it, the Lord wants to test our character sometimes and to see how we're going to, you know, how we're going to behave in certain situations. And here it's clear the Lord wants to see how Joseph is going to handle the situation. Now, obviously, God knows everything. He's omniscient. But again, sometimes when we're wrong, when we're mistreated, right, the Lord is, is testing us and, and wants us to, to 
to see for ourselves how we behave in these situations. And the more we can have an attitude that we don't want to expose someone to public disgrace, the better off we'll be. Now, listen, no one is saying that the behavior is okay when we've been wronged, right? When we've been cheated, when we've, when we've been dishonored. Again, it's, it's not okay, okay? Um, the point is we need to live in a lifestyle of forgiveness and not wanting to consistently point out other people's wrongs. As I've said, um, you know, I consistently in examining myself and seeing areas of my life where, man, I, I need to do better in that. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't need to say that. I didn't need to do that. You know, I don't need to have those kind of thoughts, right? That, that kind of anger, that bitterness, that impatience, um, the just uh, aggravation, irritation, all the different things, right, um, that we struggle with. But after he had considered this, he was the man who did, Joseph's the kind of man who doesn't just fly off the handle and react, right? He actually takes the time to think about, right, what's the, uh, what's the right course of action, right? Father Rick, um, you know, uh, my first spiritual father, you know, Father Rick, he, uh, you know, I remember when he taught me that, uh, that Jesus never reacted, but always acted. OK, like if, if someone cuts you off in traffic and you get mad and you start screaming or worse, maybe, you you know, you you give them a hand signal, right? Uh, a vulgar hand signal. You've now reacted. You've allowed that person and that situation to control you. Right. Where instead of where, you know, something happens to you, you get cut off in traffic, you're angry. You just you, you, you consider what happened. You're calm about it, and you just you ask for the Lord's blessing and favor on him in the Lord, right? Right, to Father Rick. Jesus never reacted, but always acted. We live far too much in reaction. We allow the person and the circumstance to control what we do. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, It's interesting. So he's blessed with a dream from the Lord. And we're not told who the angel is here. Uh, you know, very possibly it was Gabriel, the same angel, right? And said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And again, I firmly believe that Mary would have told Joseph. Joseph didn't believe her. And now he has a dream. And it is confirmed to him in the dream that... The baby in Mary, Mary was not unfaithful, and it is the Holy Spirit that conceived the Savior in, in Mary, and Mary was not unfaithful to him in any way. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, remember the, the angel told Mary and, and Luke, you're going to give him the name Jesus. Here, the angel says she'll give birth to a son. She will give birth to a son. There was never any chance that Mary was going to be killed or stoned, but Mary doesn't know that, right? She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And why? Because he will save his people from their sins. At the bottom of all things, we need a savior, okay? We are a sinful people. All humanity is sinful. Every human being is in a hopeless, helpless, desperate situation, right, Scott? Um, all 8 billion people in the world are sinful, and every one of us needs a savior. And without Jesus, only eternal hell awaits, okay? All of us have done wrong, okay? Jesus of his own mouth in John 14, 6 said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have a sin problem. All the good we do won't take away our sin. We are hopeless, helpless, desperate. We need a Savior. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Have you called out to him? Have you humbled yourself before him and acknowledged, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinful person. I know I can't save myself. Lord, I know that I'm hopeless and desperate without you. But Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. And I do believe you came into this world and lived a perfect life even for me and died a torturous death, Lord, on the cross even for me. And I believe you are alive and risen. And therefore, I humble myself before you, Jesus, and I ask you now to come into my heart, to be the Lord of my life, to save me from my sin, and to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all my faith 
and hope and trust and confidence in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. If you're not sure you're a Christian today, if you're not sure you're trusting and relying on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul and deliverance from eternal hell, then just stop the tape, go back, use the words I used and receive Jesus as your savior. Remember, it's not our words that save us, okay? It's Christ that saves us, but it's we use our words to communicate our heart to him and just sincerely, right, genuinely just give your heart to Jesus Christ and you will be forgiven. You will be saved. You will go to heaven when you die, not based on anything you've done, but by receiving Christ and what he's done on your behalf and in your place, right? He will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. So this was prophesied, right? If you go to Isaiah 7, 14 in the Old Testament, it says this, verse 23, the virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God the Son. Remember, we have a triune God, one being, okay, but three separate, distinct individual persons. I'm a human being. I'm one being, but I'm one person, John Morton. God is so immense that he too is one being, one God, but he's three distinct, separate, individual persons. And if we're in Jesus Christ today, if we've received him, we have relationship with God the Father as our heavenly Father. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and Master and King. God the Holy Spirit is our, our guide, our counselor, our comforter. Jesus Christ is the God-man. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Wow. Okay. And again, look at Joseph here. Just look at a character of Joseph again. I'll say again, um, I'm not like this man I'd like to be. Um, I desire to be. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he just had the dream, right? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Immediately, he obeys the word of God. Immediately, he repents of, of divorcing her quietly. Again, remember, he was going to divorce her quietly, verse 19. He was going to he was going to take up his stuff. He was going to walk off into the sunset. And undoubtedly, in his mind, he was going to allow Mary and whoever the guy in his mind that got her pregnant was to have a life together. And he wasn't going to see Mary hurt. He loved her enough that even though he believed she had betrayed him, he was not going to hurt her. Okay, That is a quality of love, a quality of character that's pretty much absent in the world today. And all of us ought to desire that. I desire to have that more. And, I, and, I, and Lord, I just want us all to have that more. We want to be men like Joseph. And when, we, and when we do get it wrong, he was wrong. He should have believed her. Okay? He should have known that, no, she wasn't faithful, right? As I said, it doesn't say it. I've said this three times. We believe Mary would have told Joseph. That's reasonable, right? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He obeyed the word of God. Everything we've said today is in our Bible. Do we have a heart to be like Joseph and to obey the word of God? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Mm. Father, help us to obey your word. Verse 25. This is interesting. Look at this. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. But he had no union with her. So again, he took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual intimacy with her until she gave birth to a son. So after the birth of Jesus, yes, Joseph and Mary did come together sexually. Mary was not a, a perpetual virgin her whole life. Okay, This teaching is plain. It's in every Bible. Matthew 1 verse 25. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. 
And that's not easy, right? You take this woman home as your wife and husband and wives want to come together in sexual intimacy, right? Benny, right? Peyton, you know, um, beautiful couple. They're going to be getting married soon here in February, right? But he had no union with her, right, Ian? Until she gave birth to a son. So he continues to honor the fact that she's carrying the Savior. But after Jesus is born, they surely come together and we see in the scriptures that they have other children together, right? But once again, we just see this man who has such self-control, right? How many of us as husbands and wives, once we were married, could wait another how many months is it? Is another six months, right? Before having sexual intimacy with our spouse, right? But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Well, this is not normally what we hear in a Christmas story, right? And so when you just break this down and when you look at it, again, the incredible character of Mary and the difficulty that she had to endure, she literally did nothing wrong, right? And yet, you know, she had people thinking the most horrible things of her. Um, And again, just this character of Joseph. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Father, I ask you to forgive us, forgive me where we're not quiet about other people's failures, or or we go out of our way to tell others where we have been wronged, or we have been ill-used, or we have been disrespected, Lord, where we've been hurt or betrayed. Father, we want to be men and women that are like Joseph, Lord. Help us to be the type of men and women that consider things, that consider what's right, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be men and women who don't look to expose others, Lord. And forgive us, Father, where we, where we certainly have done that. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our God and that you came to be with us. And we thank you that you're with us even today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this message to our hearts now. We ask you to give us eyes that see Jesus, ears that hear Jesus, and hearts to love him. We love you and bless you. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.